Well, guys, we are in the book of Proverbs on Wednesday night, and we want to invite you to be there with us in a place where we join th- journey through this and seek to understand what God has for us. You guys know how this works, so I don't need to spend much time on it, but we have the Bible reading booklet if you are interested in doing it, which is actually just the Bible. Uh, we've printed out Proverbs uh, chapter by chapter here in a space that we're encouraging you to be able to take this and mark it up and, and follow along with us. If you're joining us online, we want to let you know that that's available for you. You can go to our website at calvaryrosal.com, go under the messages, and then under today's message, you'll get a little download tab. You can download the PDF of this mess of this booklet, print it out, or you can just use it uh, on a a device that you have, kind of as a PDF, and and hoping that you'd be able to do that. We're going to journey through this as we've been, where we'll just be marking this up with both colors and lines that'll seek to focus on good things, bad things. You guys know how this works. We've kind of walked through this. There's a legend there if you need it. In the back of your book, you can find it. But tonight, we just want to go into this space where we're wanting God to speak to us through His Word. We're wanting that He would take the things that He has before us and and give us understanding, both in this moment, but in our lives. So I'm going to lead you in prayer. I'm going to ask for God to do that, that he would indeed show us things, that he would speak to you and speak to me, that he'd help us to get this. And I just believe in his faithfulness, but I'm inviting you to pray as well, that you would be asking, that God would speak to you what he has for you tonight. So let's go and ask him for that now. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for truth. Thank you for your guidance. And even as we're here in the book of Proverbs, for your wisdom. God, you call us to be a people that would respond well to that, that would respond well to your truth, that we would be those who are seeking and seeking to understand. You call us away from being arrogant, from being a scoffer, from being foolish and rejecting your ways. I just simply ask for that right now, that you would find us into a place that we are journeying towards growing in your wisdom, growing in your understanding, that we're not doing our own thing, going our own path. And to that end, would you open up these passages tonight in ways that we understand it, but in ways that speak very directly into our lives. God, would you help us right now? Would you help us right now to hear that and to hear it individually and even to lock even a single one of these Proverbs very directly into our lives? God, would you do that in your favor, in your help, in your presence? We ask for it right now from your hand into this moment, and we ask for it together in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wisdom. It is the subject matter of the book of Proverbs, and some have said that you could almost think about it this way. It's wisdom for living, that it's this place where God is seeking to show us how to actually live. It's not the kind of thing that brings us head knowledge. The book of Proverbs isn't this place that takes you into, you know, PhD level kind of, you know, just debating about things that isn't always even actually in the middle of life. Proverbs isn't that. It is a space where it talks about exactly where we are, how we're walking through it, and inviting you and I into a place where our lives would be flowing in that direction. And so we're working through Proverbs. Again, you guys know how this works. We, as we journey through it, the Proverbs, each one can be different, working through the chapter. And yet the theme of it all is to bring us to a place of the way that God would have us to live our lives, that he would meet you and I in wisdom. May he do that tonight. Well, we joined where we picked up last week. We made it through verse 14. We're in verse 15, kind of an odd one just to begin with, but we'll begin there because that's where we left off. So verse 15 laziness casts one into a deep sleep, and an idle person will suffer hunger. Laziness. Quick pause and just understand this. Laziness is a constant focus in the book of Proverbs, because certainly one of the things it speaks to us is the danger, uh, the danger of, of one who would live a life of being lazy. I don't think we have to have you know, huge definitions of that. We know that. Probably all of us struggle with it some. Some struggle with it more. But there is a place of just making sure that we have it valued. That God would say, okay, you just need to see it and say, here's what laziness do. It would cast you. It would cast you into a deep sleep. It's almost as if laziness creates more laziness. 
uh, laziness kind of just begins to just draw into this space where it would become hard. And he just says it will cause that person to suffer hunger, that this idle person who is lazy will find themselves without. Again, Proverbs just comes to us to make sure that you and I would set it. And it's as if in many ways that it, this kind of proverb kind of becomes almost a compass in our life. Almost a place that if you kind of are journeying through life, you would be able to look and say, okay, you know, to be faithful, to be industrious, to be about the things that God has for us, it's, it's this direction, but to go the wrong direction is, is, is over here. And just to kind of say, okay, am I, which way am I orienting in this? That in one sense to look and say, okay, laziness, it's, it's, it's a pull that would take me down a road that would be destructive. It's really, really important. Again, we've talked about it a bunch so far already in Proverbs, so I just quickly highlight it and say it this way. If you believe this, then you will recognize that you are fundamentally going against uh, the direction that our world is going in. Uh, our world is championing la laziness, almost saying, hey, like that would be the ultimate life. If you could just be lazy, that is life at, 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 at its key p pitch, and it's just not so. It would be emptiness, and he just invites us to see that. All right, so leaving that, we'll get a little bit more in the chapters we keep going, but go on to verse 16 on the next page. He who keeps the commandment keeps his soul, but he who is careless of his ways will die. So the positive thing that it's holding out is one who keeps, holds to, believes in, trusts in, keeps the commandment. He says, if you do that, you keep your soul. You, you keep your soul. He who is careless of his ways, that you, in that sense you find yourself not doing that, will die. Well, you gaze into this in one sense. It's not that hard to understand, but there are a few things just to make sure you lock your brain around. First of all, it might be interesting just to note the way it says it in the, in the singular way. It doesn't say, now, he who keeps the commandments. It says, those who keep the commandment. This is just an interesting way to say it. I think I could make a good argument that he's talking about the commandment, the great commandment, which is to love God. Jesus says, hey, it's the great commandment. And the second one actually connects to it, and everything in the Bible flows from that, that he's simply calling us to that, that he would say, okay, this is that. Certainly that's what he's pointing to, and he's kind of telling us, hey, this is what you need to keep. It's, it's the commandment. It's, it's, it's what God has for our life. He says, if you keep this, if you keep what God has for us, you keep and you protect your soul. In contrast, he who is careless of his ways. Now, it's one of those interesting Bible questions or Bible you know, student questions. When it says, is it his ways, is it our ways or God's ways? Well, there's probably both some truth there. If you're careless of life, if you're just, you know, just un, you know, just focused on where you're going, it's a carelessness, so it will go there. But it's probably better understood as God's ways, that if you are careless in understanding what he has, careless in the commandment, which is kind of what it's talking about in this passage, if you are, you know, treating that carelessly, he says it, it, it'll, it'll destroy you. I like the way the New Living Translation kind of puts that together. It says, keep the commandments and keep your life. Despising them leads to death. Hey, if you, just, if you hold this, this will keep you. But if you, you despise God's word, you are careless with it, it's going to bring about destruction. And he just invites us to that, that we would be those who value it. Because it's not just a secondary thing. It's not just something that's, hey, you know, Bible reading and being serious about the Bible, that's, you know, something for Bible nerds or anything like that. No, it's like, it's your life. It, it is your very soul. It, it's you. And the Word of God speaks into that. And there's a place where you and I are meant to just know that and, and to be people that love the Word of God, keep it, and, and seek to walk in all that's there. Certainly, God would call us to that. And simply, He's inviting you and I into that space. All right. Well, verse 17. He who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, and he will pay back what he has given. God invites us to be those who recognize, who care for the poor. It's one of the things we've talked about. In fact, we began our study last week just kind of highlighting that Jesus told us, hey, this is something we're going to have with us always. This is the poor. You're always going to have to be making sure that you care for and you are conscious of that. 
And he just simply invites us to understand it this way. If you do that, if you honestly have a concern for those who are poor and even kind of reach out to them and, and, and show pity to them, he says, you're lending to the Lord, which is a fascinating way to say it. He says, if, if you'll do this, if you, you know, will do that, then God becomes the one who will pay back. He will pay back what he has given. What an incredible way to see that, you know, to, to see it that way, because it can really get this way. In our own selfish world, sometimes we can be like, I don't want to help anybody. Like, it's like, what good is that going to do? I mean, there's, there's no return on that investment, and probably, I don't even know if it's going to good, and God says, hey, where you are kind, that's, that's on me, and the Lord will repay. God, God never, you know, misses repaying any of that. He, he is a faithful God, and what an incredible space it would invite us to say, God, I want to do this for you. God, I want to do whatever it is I'm going to do. I want to do it for you and, and for your name and for your honor and find that God would be the one that would say, hey, I, I, I care for that and I will be the one that will bless you if you have that heart that, that cares for others and, and seeks to shine that in ways that are all together good. All right. Verse 18. Chasing your son while there is hope and do not set your heart on his destruction. It's just chasing your son. Do this. Care for this in a way that you are, are watching over your, your, your son. Your, your, and the idea that in the midst of this, obviously, speaking of sons or daughters, it's speaking of parents and telling them, hey, discipline them. You know, discipline them while you can do that. It says, do that while there is hope. And as you do that, he says, and don't set your heart on his destruction. Don't, don't make your heart go there where that's your focus, where you're thinking about his destruction. So again, not a hard proverb to understand, but it's worth us just making sure we're hearing it. Again, just speaking to parents, and I recognize there's not a, you know, a lot of here in the room. Some of you are still in that space. Some of you, are, you know, have this. Some will be listening later, but there's a space where right now he just says, that's a very limited opportunity. Chasing them. Chasing them while there's still hope. Now, again, I know this. For many of you, 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 you've walked through that road. And if you have been a parent and maybe your, parent, your, 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 your kids are no longer at home, you would understand. It's no longer my power. I, I can't send them to their room any longer. You know, I kind of still send I mean, I don't know about anybody else. There's spaces I would like to. You know, it's like, where you're just like, okay, no, like you, like you're grounded. Like, that's it. You can't do that today. There, there's, there, you no longer have that authority and that space to do that. And so he's speaking to those who have that. And he says, hey, don't miss that opportunity. David Guzik in his commentary on it says it this way. He says, there is not an endless window of opportunity to chase and wisely discipline our children. Age and circumstances limit the opportunity for effective training. So this is a very small window of life that you have this space uh, to do that as, as a parent. So it must be done while there's still hope, while there's still a chance that that's going to be received and, and could work good. There may come a, a time when you wish you had done much more to chasten your son or daughter. And the sad reality is some of us know that. Some of us in this space, man, it's like, I wish I could go back. I mean, if I could go back, and then you can't. You can't go back, and so again, God calls us to leave the, the, the past behind us. We need to do that, but there is a space right now speaking to those who are there, like, don't miss this window. Don't miss what it is. It's key. It's a, it's a part of life. Do that while there's still a chance, while there's still hope, and then he adds to it this. Do not set your heart on his destruction. What does that mean? Honestly, there's a few possibilities. Maybe it includes all of them. Uh, there's a few things that it could mean. We'll just quickly walk through it. It could just mean by failing to discipline. That it could be the idea that in context, and there's a number of, uh, of Bible commentators and, and, and Hebrew scholars specifically that kind of look at this that say, you know, that if you don't chasten your son, it's as if that's what you've set your heart on. You, you set your heart on their destruction. If you fail to be that parent, you know, then, then you are failing them in that sense. And so there's going to be other Proverbs that say a little bit of the same thing, like if you don't chase in your kids, you don't love them. You know, there's a space of saying, hey, that's, that's a part of it. So it could be just a restatement of the need to be disciplining your kids. Good possibility. Others would say, well, there's a space of doing it right and, and, and not provoking uh, your children to wrath. I think about how it says it in Ephesians. 
where it says, And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. It's like, hey, you train them, admonish them, discipline them, but there's a space where you would be provoking, where you would be creating uh, rebellion and lots of interesting things to think about in that, but it could be saying that. Maybe, though, maybe the most simple way to understand this is to think about it literally, and so maybe we'd say it this way. Um, don't be abusive. Don't, don't go into that space where, you know, that is in your discipline, you're actually becoming destructive. And I think it's a good, good word. I mean, it's a good word to think it through. In fact, I'll just give it to you in the way that landed for me the most a, a, as a dad in raising my girls. I think about how he gives it to us in James, where it says, See then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. I read it in its entire context. That whole, whole sentence goes together, but it's that final section of it that really did speak into my life. It says, you know, your anger will never do it. You know, your anger will never produce God's righteousness. It was a good warning for me as a dad. It was a good space to realize, like, I need to discipline my kids, but there's a line that can be crossed. And that line really gets crossed when I'm angry. And I'm not disciplining them for their good. I'm not disciplining them for, uh, you know, hey, I'm just trying to teach you to do what's right. It's like, I'm angry, you know. And, and, and I just, you know, had to kind of let this kind of soak them. It's like, okay, if that's where I am. I can't do it. You know, I was happy, you know, might tell the kids, like, we're going to have a talk in about an hour. <laughs> like, like, I'm going to cool down first, and then we're going to have a talk. We're not going to have it now, because if I do it, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to do it well. Because that, that, that discipline isn't meant to be a display of a parent's anger. It's not meant to be rage. It's not meant to be that place that, again, can become be abusive. It's meant to be training. And so, again, for me, it just was one of these things. Again, I don't know if it works for anybody else or helps anybody else, but this just did it. It's almost just to tell me, like, Jim, you lose your temper, and you will never produce what God wants to have in their kids. That'll never work. You'll never see true righteousness flow out of that. That'll never do that. And I guess that's not what I was aiming at when I disciplined my kids. I wanted righteousness. I wanted them to do what was right. I wanted them to grow in godliness. And so it could be that in one sense, that's exactly what's being said here in this proverb. Like, hey, you discipline them, but don't let your heart become that that wants to destroy them. Don't be that place where you slip into that place of anger and doing that. And it's just that right place of godly discipline, which is an absolutely beautiful thing which is an absolutely beautiful thing. Can I just pause and say this? It's such a picture of our God. You know, we think about where we are tonight, and, you know, if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've come into a relationship with him, this is how God sees you. He tells us he disciplines us. He tells us in Hebrews that there's not a single one of his kids that he doesn't discipline. In fact, he says it this way, if you're not getting disciplined by God, you're not his kid. Because God doesn't ever do that. He doesn't ever not discipline one of his kids. And again, if I'll just say it that way, if you're here tonight or you're looking online, you're like, I don't even know what you're talking about. God discipline you? What's that? It's like, okay, well, we need, might need to talk about Jesus. Because, uh, you know, if you don't know him, if you're not in a relationship with God, you know, you, you don't become a child of God. But if you are his, then you become a child of God and, and God begins to discipline you. But please understand this. It's never... It's never in this place that God sets his heart in your destruction. He is never, you know, just angry at you and kind of letting that come. You know, there's no wrath on us as believers. He's removed all. There's no condemnation for those who are believers. So as God disciplines us, it's always for our good. It is always for our good. And it is always right. And it is always aimed at righteousness. And it's a good space for us to recognize that in his good dealings with us, that he is the one who does this in our lives, and that he is doing that for our good. Again, if we always believed that, that would be great. I mean, sometimes it's that place where, you know, sometimes kids are like, you know, you don't love me. That's why you're doing this to me. You just, you hate me. It's like, I don't. But I mean, it's one of those places that kids can feel that way, but sometimes so can believers. Sometimes believers who can feel like God's disciplining, and we just, you know, immediately flip the switch. It's like, man, he hates me. He's so angry at me. It's like, no, he is not. No, he's not. If he's disciplining us, it's always for our good. All right, well, flip the page. Verse 19, a man of great wrath will suffer punishment, for if you rescue him, you will have to do it again. 
great wrath. By the way, I think most of you know this, so I don't always, you know, I want to say the same thing every week, but one of the nice things about the New King James Version is it, you know, gives us a place of what's actually in the text, and we talk about it every now and then, but the Hebrew Bible, uh, as it's translated into English, sentences are different, structure's different, and so when they were creating it in English, they added words, but anytime you see the italics, it's words that are not actually in the Hebrew text. They're added for clarity in English, but not actually there, so it's always good to read it without it, so even when I try to do the boxes for the most part, that's what we'll just focus on. So in the Hebrew, it's just great wrath. Great wrath, suffer punishment. Great wrath equals suffering punishment. Like, that's what it does. Angriness, people who lose their temper, which is kind of interesting if that's what we just talked about in the last verse about parents. It's like, okay, you do this, it does this. You'll always suffer punishment. For, he says, if you rescue somebody, if you rescue somebody who's in that place of wrath, you will have to do it again. It's a pretty simple thing. Again, you understand it. Maybe you have somebody in that like right now. Maybe it's in your family, and you know this. It's like they, they're an angry person, and they cause problems, and I have to rescue them. It's not saying that we shouldn't rescue them. It's not saying that it's wrong. It's just saying that it's, that's you know, anger. You just can know it. It's going to create a space. It's going you know, it, it, to create conflict. It's going to create you know, family divides. It's going to just cause problems. And he's again, just calling us to see that it's not good, that this place of the wrath of man or the anger of man, it will always cause punishment and uh, problems that people have to rescue us out of. May God rescue us from that. All right. Verse 20. Listen to counsel and receive instruction that you may be wise in your latter days. This is one of those simple proverbs that isn't really a comparison between two thoughts. It's a single thought that flows forward. And he just says, listen. Be those who are listening to truth, listening to instruction, receiving it, that you can be wise. That it will, you'll be a person who's growing in wisdom. Again, he's inviting us into this space, as he just said in a, a few proverbs before this, that we value the word of God and that we esteem that. And we ought to be those who are constantly listening to it because we want to get wiser. I mean, it's as if, you know, it's as if we could look at ourselves and say, you know, God, if God gives me more time, I hope I'm wiser in a year from now than I am now. I, I hope that I'm going to continue on this journey where, you know, you will look and think, okay, this is where I'm going. I want to listen to counsel. I want to receive instruction. And I want to be a wiser person. And he's just inviting us to have that heart. May it be so tonight, even as you approach the Proverbs, that God would give you just a desire for that, just a desire to grow. All right. Verse 21. There are many plans in a man's heart. Nevertheless, the Lord's counsel, that will stand. That will stand. So he gives it to us and he talks about this idea of plans, of plans that are involved inside the heart of men and women, that we are those who make plans. He says that's what we are. We just have a lot of them. There's a lot of things that happen in the midst of that. Nevertheless, that's the comparative word here. He says the Lord's counsel, what he has for us, what his plans are for our lives, that's going to be the thing that stands. This is a pretty powerful truth. In fact, it's one of those ones that weaves itself through Proverbs. It definitely ties into a number of thoughts. I find myself thinking back to where we were in chapter 16, where he just invited us as a man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. And one of the things that we were just invited to see is there is a difference. There's a, there's a very clear difference sometimes between what we're thinking and what God's thinking, that we make plans, and yet God directs our lives. Part of the, this whole understanding would invite us to be those that live our lives in light of this. I think about how James would say it. He says, come now you who say today or tomorrow, we will go to such and such a city, spend a year there, buy and sell and make a profit. He says, come for, for you guys who have plans. Like you have plans. You, got the, you have life kind of figured out. You have the future kind of figured out. You know what's going to happen. You know where you're going. He says, here's what we're going to say. If you, if you already kind of have these plans in there, he says, whereas you have no idea. You really have no idea where this is going. You have no idea what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? It's even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. He says, you have no idea how long life is. You have no idea what's going to happen tomorrow. So instead, you ought to be the person that says, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. 
but now you boast in your arrogance, and all such boasting is evil. Hear me again clearly. God is not just cha- uh, you know, kind of pro- giving us the offer of changing the way we say things. You don't have to say it this way all the time, but it needs to be in your heart. He says we ought to be those who, yeah, we make plans. In fact, in this text, you can still see it. We still are going to say, okay, if God opens that door, this is what I'm planning to do. <laughs> I'm planning to do this or that. That's just the way it works. We, we are always doing that. There's not a wrong space that we live and make plans, but we should be those who always recognize God's will overrides. You know, here's what I'm thinking is going to happen this week, but if God has a different plan, we're going to take his plan. Like his, his plan is going to be the thing that, that, that lands in this. This is going to be the, spang, the places that goes there. And so it would seem here in this verse, he's telling us the same thing. He says we got a lot of them. Got a lot of plans in there, got a lot of things happening in there, but it's what God has. It's what God's counsel is, that that's going to be the thing that ultimately, you know, leads and, and would draw in our lives. And so in many ways, again, he's calling us to orient our lives this way. And again, he's calling us to live our lives this way. See, again, it's not a guarantee that you're going to walk in all of God's counsel. It's not a guarantee that you're going to walk on all of his plans because, again, that's what sin is. Sin is a rejection uh, of God's plans. It's a way of saying, hey, I'm going to go my own way. I'm going to do my own thing. And so he's calling us to be able to say, I don't want to do that. And if I don't want to do that, not only do I need to recognize that God's ways and my ways might be different, and I'm open to God changing in a moment, and I'm open to God just saying, hey, I'll go this direction, you know, but to live our lives desiring to seek that. To say, okay, God, I want to do this. I want to be this person that would say, I, I want that. Almost as if you could say, okay, I'm going to choose between my plans or God's counsel. And, and, and where the two would be different. It would be like, I'm going to take, take him. <laughs> like, like, he's smarter than I am. I mean, you know, I, he knows better. He knows me better. He knows the plan better. And so I need to be this person that isn't stuck in my plans, isn't stuck just doing life my way. Again, there's a dozen applications of this, but I'm just inviting you to it. I'm inviting you to it, not just in a way that you would just own this as a truth. It's like, oh, that's probably true, but into a truth that would affect your life, into a place that you're asking for God's will, that, that daily you're praying, even as Jesus taught us to pray, Lord, your will be done on earth, not, not, not mine. Like, you show me what you want. Like, I'm, I'm open to you changing, you interrupting, you going in a different direction, and I want that. I, I want what that is. And, and to humble ourselves there, again, James says, if we're not doing this, he says, you are arrogant. You are arrogant, you know, just, you know, boasting high against this. And so this, again, calls us into this space of both humility and openness and dependence, and just this beautiful place of wanting God's will in our life, wanting what God would have for us, and certainly what he would long for us in in everything that's there, and so he's inviting you and I into a space that we would live there. May it be so for you. May it be one that you would look and say, that's what what I'm trying to do. That's a good verse for me, because that's exactly how I want to live my life. Turn the page. Verse 22 what is desired in a man is kindness, and a poor man is better than a liar. What's desired? What, what's, what's wanted is the idea kindness. He invites us to be a people who, who are that way. And, he says, it kind of as a comparative word there, a poor man, to be poor, that's better than being a liar. That's better than going the opposite way. So again, this one giving us this place where we're looking at things and saying them very, very different. What God is looking for is kindness. Now, the Hebrew word is chesed, and some of you would recognize it. It's a very powerful Hebrew word that is hard to translate. Sometimes it's translated love or loving kindness. Sometimes it's translated mercy. Sometimes it's translated as here kindness, and it just kind of encompasses all of that, that there is this sense, here's what I want. I want this. I want I, I'm, I'm looking for this in your life. I'm looking for you to be a person who would say, I want to I be this person that loves God, loves people, that walks in his mercy and his kindness, and I want to be known by that. It's certainly the plan that he would have for my life. 
And so he gives it to us with a, a simple kind of contrast compliment that would say, it would be better to be poor than a liar. A liar is obviously the opposite of it, and I find myself thinking of what the Bible tells us, that Satan is the father of lies, that lies so much permeate our culture and go the wrong way, and he's telling us it would be better for you to be loving and kind and poor than to be rich and, and, and a liar. You know, that would be good, take a, a life that's altogether a destruction. So he's just saying, you know, it would be better to choose a life that would be that way. It doesn't always mean that you're going to be poor if you're kind, but it is telling us it would be far better. Now, that's actually how our chapter began back in verse 1. It said, better is the poor who walks in integrity than the one who is perverse in his lips and is a fool. It would be so much better, you know, for us to choose integrity, to choose that which is good and right, even if it doesn't make us advance in the world, even if it doesn't, you know, win us the promotions or the advancements in career or whatever that would be, it would be so much better, uh, you know, to choose a life that would walk in kindness. I, I, you know, I find myself thinking, you know, that you probably understand this. You probably, you know, at least in some measure, think this through. But I'm just telling you, if, you, if you're not aware, that's just not the way our world works. I remember sitting there one time, and I was uh, working at the bank a long time ago in Albuquerque before I got here, and sitting down kind of in that kind of promotion place. I'd gotten into a place where they were, you know, training us up to be, to, to, to go up into management in, in, the, in the bank, and I was talking to people as to why they were there and what they were doing, and I can just remember. I remember sitting down with a couple people, and they just basically told me, Jim, I'm going to do whatever it takes. I'm going to do whatever it's takes. I'm going to be an officer before you. I don't care who I have to step on. I don't care who I have to hurt. I don't care what it takes. I'm going to advance. And I remember just thinking, wow, okay. Like, that's really, really, that's like, I'm not. You know, it's like, I'm not going to forsake my character to, to get a promotion. Like, that's not going to be the road I'm going to take. But I remember just thinking that that is the way that some people are living their lives. And he just says that would be a poor choice. That would be a poor choice. It would be so much better to think, okay, if it doesn't, give me the career. If I don't get advanced, I'm going to choose kindness. I'm going to choose to walk in God's ways. All right. Verse 23. The fear of the Lord leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction. He will not be visited with evil. So we get this place where he invites us to see the fear of the Lord. One of the things we've understood from the book of Proverbs so far is in many ways that's a definition of wisdom. It's told us already in the book of Proverbs that the fear of the Lord, it's the beginning or it's the foundation of all wisdom. That to live life the way God has you to live life would live and say, there is a God and I'm going to live my life in light of that. That's many ways what the fear is of God is. It's not a place where you're afraid of him as far as you're thinking of like lightning bolts are going to fly at any given day. But it is the idea that's like, I, I'm, I'm living my life in light of the reality that God is real. And he sees me and he's involved and I'm going to make my choices in a way that pleases him. That's the fear of God. He says, if you'll do that. And he just tells us a little bit what that is. He says, the fear of the Lord, it's life. It, it's that which leads to life. It's that which brings real spiritual life. It's that which would accomplish that where we'd be alive but on top of that, and he says it brings us to an abiding satisfaction. That's a good note. That's a good note. It's like, you want to be satisfied? You want to, you want to enjoy? You want to have life? And you want to walk in a space of, of satisfaction? He says, you fear God. And more than that, it's protective. It would protect you from evil. It would protect you from everything that's there. So he just gives, he gives us a list of three things. He says, hey, if you fear God, that's life. That satisfies, and that'll protect you. This, this will be that which is life for you. It would be that which would give you satisfaction, and it would be that which would protect you. It would make it in that sense, again, so you could look at the, that's a better way to go. It's a better way to live your life. This is the, the way that God would have us. And I think about Jesus who told us, you know, he says the enemy comes in to rob, kill, and destroy. He says, but I've come to give you life. I'm going to give you life and that which is abundant life. This is the road that where this comes. This is the space where it is, where we should value it and say, that's the choice I want. I want to live my life day by day in light of this reality that God is God and his ways are right and his ways would work good. 
in your life, in my life, to draw us to everything that is there. This really is, again, the heart of Proverbs. It's the heart of everything that would be there and say, this is what would make it so good. And oh, how I long that you would discover it to be true, that you would find yourself. Maybe again, maybe it's tonight that a single proverb is like, okay, I'm gonna have to think that one through and I have to reorient my life a little bit. Like I, got, I get my values off every now and then and it has to just reorient me. I hope that you would do that. And then you would find out, huh, there's life here. It's really satisfying to do life the way that God wants me to do it. And you know what? It rescues me. I mean, just that you would find it to be practically so. I hope you do. hope that you would discover that even in real ways. May God work that in your life and mine. So verse 24 takes us back to laziness. It says it this way, A lazy man buries his hand in the bowl and will not so much as bring it to his mouth again. It's a funny one. I just want you to think about it. It says, here's this lazy person, someone who's walking in unbiblical laziness. He says, here's this person, and there they are. It's like they have their, their, their food in front of them. They bury their hand inside the bowl, and then it just so you know, lazy in the midst of it, won't even bring it to their mouth again. Now, this is obviously very probable, just hyperbole. It's, it's, it's meant to be funny. I mean, it's meant to, I mean, I don't know how good of imagination you have. I just want you to try to imagine it. I mean, just look at somebody there, and there they are. They got their morning cereal. I don't know. It's there in the bowl, and they got their spoon, and they put it in. It's like, oh, uh, I don't even want to live. It was just, uh, yeah, I'm hungry, but I don't feel like feeding myself. Like, would somebody feed me? You know, is, is somebody just, you know, scoop the spoon. It's like, what a crazy thing that would be. It's like, you're, it's, it's right in front of you. I mean, we're not even talking like, you know, go out and cut down a tree or something. I mean, it's right, your hand is in the bowl, and, and yet what an incredible just sorrow that would be. And that's a, in many ways what laziness would be, a place where, you know, it's not always that, you know, God's inviting us to live some hard life that would be, it's like, it is right in front of you, eat it. Like, I mean, all you have to do is, 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 is scoop it. And honestly, there's some who are living their lives like that right now. There are some who laziness has taken hold of them, and you're like, you know, you got a job. I mean, just go to work. I mean, it's not even that hard of work. It's like, it doesn't take that long. It's not, it's not even that hard. It's like, oh, I don't know if I want to, you know. And you think, why, what is there in this that captures the heart of somebody and leads them into a life that would rob them of joy and rob them of satisfaction and rob them of all this good. So again, he's just highlighting the folly of it. And again, probably most of us have struggled with this some. Some of us struggle with it more. We just need to look at it and go, that's not a good thing. Like when, when, I'm, when, when that kind of grips me, that is not a good moment. You know, laziness is not a good, it is not a defining place that I'd look and say, hey, that's, that's life. That's abiding in satisfaction. No, it's like, that is not satisfying. It doesn't go a right direction. And he just kind of puts it for us in a funny way so that we can look at it and think, that would be a dumb way uh, to live our lives. May God rescue us from laziness. We'll flip the page. Verse 25. Strike a scoffer, and the simple will become wary. Rebuke one who has understanding, and he will discern knowledge. He gives us this highlight again of how wisdom is being learned or how it can happen. He says, you know, if you take someone who's a scoffer, this is someone who doesn't want to learn, doesn't want to be told what's right, doesn't want to receive God's instruction. You tell them what's right and they just like, hmm, don't tell me what to do. Don't tell me anything. You can't tell me what's right. He says you, you do that and you try to confront somebody in that you strike them they just become wary of even like listening to you. Like, I'm not going to come around you. I'm not going to, you know, they're not learning from what you're saying. They're just pulling back from it. In contrast, rebuke one who has understanding. Someone who is growing in, a, in understanding, growing his ways, says they'll discern knowledge. They, they, you know, you don't even, it doesn't even take that. And again, if you can kind of catch the contrast, it's as if you're looking at somebody who is doing poorly and we've gone way past the just speaking to them. Now it's striking. Again, I, I'm just thinking of this as a parent, so I'm just assuming that for some of you parents, you'd be in the same place. You know, there's that kind of, kind of growing disobedience. You know, there's like, a, hey, you know, 
Why don't you pick up your stuff and put it in the line? It's like, you know, and, then, and you know, it's like you, it starts with the verbal warnings, and then it's like, hey, you know, you don't, and then pretty soon it's like, okay, we're, we're, this, we're moving closer and closer to like physical punishment. Like we are going to, you know, pull out the rod and, and you know, but you, know, you kind of work your way there. So it, it's kind of in this place where the simple person, it's all the way there, and it's just not doing any good. There, no matter, no matter, it's escalated to that space is not doing it. On the other hand, this person who is understanding, you know, they can get it like long before that. It's like, okay, yeah, I got it. Just tell me I'm wrong. Remind me that I'm doing it. Like, hey, yes, I can pick up my stuff. You know, yes, I realize that's a, you know, just leaving it. That, okay, that's mom, dad, that's all it takes. I mean, it's this beautiful place for someone who's wanting to do the right thing that it doesn't take a whole lot of discipline. May it be so for you and I, because God is that one who is disciplining us. He is that faithful father. May you be one that's like, it does, you know, God doesn't have to smack me over the head with a two by four. You know, like, it just, it's sometimes it can be simple, like, oh, yep, that's wrong, that's wrong. Okay, let's, let's just receive a simple correction and very, very quickly say, okay, God, you're right, I'm wrong, let's fix it. Let's kind of go in a right direction. And he's inviting us to say, hey, we'll discern knowledge, we'll grow in that which would be a really good understanding. Sadly, again, it's just not always received. Again, some of the theme within this chapter speaks about parenting, and so he again goes to it in verse 26, speaking of this one who's not responding well. He who mistreats his father and chases away his mother is a son who causes shame and brings reproach. Kind of a sad picture. It says he who mistreats his father, and it would have the idea of almost physically resisting uh, the Hebrew word would have that, and so again, in my mind, I'm kind of picturing it as, as discipline, and, and, and you have almost a son who's like, you know, I'll fight you, <laughs> like, like, you know, like, I'll go, I'll go hand to hand with you, you know, kind of deal, you know, you try to discipline me, I'll, I, I'll, I'll resist physically, or chases away his mother, like, just, mom, go away, like, don't talk to me, like, I don't have anything to do with what you're saying, I am not listening to you, and just push it away, he says, when that happens, it's this son, it's this daughter who brings shame and, and, and just reproach. Wish it wasn't the case. I wish there was like, well, I'm glad it never works that way. I'm glad that that never happens. It just does happen. But sometimes it's just helpful to see it. So that's, that's what it is. It, there's not a good thing in this disobedience to have someone who is kind of in the light of the previous proverb, a scoffer who won't be told anything, who will resist all things. It's just a heartbreaking picture of one who would walk away from that and bring shame and reproach. It happens in families. And again, if we're thinking about it this way, we're thinking about discipline as it applies to us as children of God. Sometimes it happens in God's kids. Sometimes for God's kids, like, that's a shame. That's a reproach to resist God's discipline. It really does bring in sorrow in that. May God rescue us from that. May we not be people that are there, and may God comfort you if this is where you are. Sometimes that's just the hard place of being a parent, is having to walk through this, and some of you understand that well. Turn the page to page number 10. We get uh, Proverbs 16, verse, uh, 19, verse 27. Cease listening to instruction, my son, and you will stray from the words of knowledge. He invites us to see this and just tells us, if we stop listening, if we stop listening, he says, then you're going to stray. You're going to stray from the words of knowledge. This is a really important understanding. Now, we've talked about it from a couple different angles tonight. We've already said that we need to be the one who would say, I'm open, because I want to, as my years go on, I want to get wiser. You know, it says, it says, if you listen to wisdom, you'll become wiser and wiser as the years go on. If you're in that place of receiving and valuing and that fear of the Lord and all that's in there. But now he just gives us an interesting principle that's just make it worth making sure you understand it. For the Christian life and, and Christian knowledge never remains static you are either growing, or if I can say it differently, you're shrinking. Nobody ever stays the same. Nobody ever stays the same. You, you never get to this place of spiritual maturity where you've like, okay, I, I've done enough Bible reading. I, I understand enough truth. I memorized the verses I was supposed to memorize, and so now I'm just going to coast out the rest of my life, you know, at some, you know, level of spiritual maturity. So it's not the way it works. Stop listening, and you'll start going down. You'll, you'll start straying away from the words of knowledge. It will diminish in your life. Lots of reasons that it's so. Think about what Paul tells us. He says, our flesh is actually growing corrupt. A, you know, it's just that, you know you're, you're, the struggle that you have between the spirit and the flesh that Paul talks about in Galatians, it's actually getting worse. So if you're not growing, 
you, the flesh is going to be winning. Like, you, you're going to have to keep fighting. There's no way to, to, to do this without growing. It, you know, add to that, it's our own kind of just weakness. I, I think about, you know, one of the statements where people say, you know, you know I, I learn so many things. The problem is I just, you know, my brain leaks. You know, it's like, it's like it was there a moment ago and then it's gone. Like, what happens to that thing? Well, it's, there's lots of reasons it happens, but it's a simple statement of fact. If you're not growing, then you're shrinking. If you're not moving forward in Christ, then you're going to be moving downward. Now, good move for you being here this evening. I would assume that you being here this evening and diving into the Word of God tonight is you saying, I want to grow. Like, I, I'd like to get wiser. I'd like to get a little bit smarter. I'd like to be more godly. Good move. Just know this. You can't ever stop. You can't ever stop. Because if you get to the place where it's like, yeah, I read the Bible. Yeah, I used to go to church. It will go the other way. It will not stay that way. And some of you know people like this. I know that for some of you, are like, yeah, I used to know this person. And it's like, boy, we read the Bible together. We did, but, you know, and, and then they just, you know, for a little while, they seemed like they were there. And then it just slowly ebbed away. And, 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 they, and they just began to stray. They just began to move astray. There's no other way about it. There ought to be a place that for you, as it is for me, that we'd look and say, okay, God, as much time as I have left in life, I don't know how long that is. Maybe I have months, maybe I have years, maybe I have decades. I will never outgrow my need to be in the word of God and, and, and to be growing in his wisdom. I will never get to that space where I've learned enough. I will never get to that space that I don't need it any longer because the only way that's going to help me to finish this life well, to do what it said earlier in the chapter, like if you'll listen to this, you can grow wise into your, your later years. The only way that's going to happen is if I just make that, you know, kind of a priority for the rest of my life. And again, I, I'm looking at you guys and thinking that's probably where you are, but just in case, just in case you have any false notion of it, in case the lie would ever get there where you would say, you know, there, there's spaces where you ought to be a Bible reader, and then there's spaces that you can let go. There's spaces where you can like, okay, I've read the whole thing twice now, or I've read the whole thing. You know, you'll never outgrow the scriptures, nor will you ever outgrow your need for it. So I just speak it to you again, and just say, I hope that's the value you place on God's wisdom and God's truth. So you will say, I want to listen to instruction. I, I want to continue to listen to God's instruction, to the fear of God, and I know that I'll need that for the absolute rest of my life. May God make you and I such people, because sadly, not everybody is. We get the last couple verses of the chapter, and we get a chance of just seeing some of the negative ways that this will flow out in other people's lives. He says, a disreputable witness scorns justice, and the mouth of the wicked devours iniquity. So this disreputable witness, it's a liar. It's a term of saying somebody who would be willing to stand in a courtroom and lie, or someone who would be willing to lie to a friend, or lie about anything to get whatever they need, to be like that person I spoke of a moment. I'll do whatever it takes. I'll do whatever it takes to get ahead. He says, if you are that person, then justice is scorned, but that what's right and what's good is mocked by you. And such a person, it's as if that mouth, you're, you're hungry, it's as if you're just devouring iniquity. It's as if you're just eating iniquity. It's as if that's the choice you'll be making, and it will become altogether destructive. To be that person that chooses what's wrong, it will be absolutely horrible. Which, verse 29, then tells us, judgments are prepared for scoffers and beatings for the back of fools. It says if you're looking at this, and you're looking at someone and you're saying, okay, God's judgments and judgments are going to be coming for those who scoff, those who say, I don't need it. I don't need to hear. I don't need anything. I'm rejecting God's wisdom. It says on top of that, it's as if you could look and say beatings are there for those who would live foolish lives. If you, if you look at these people who are now going to choose to do life very different than what we just saw two verses before this, they said, I'm going to need God's instruction all the days of my life. It's the only way I'm going to do the right thing. Here are people that say, I don't need it. I don't need God's word. I don't need his truth. And it's as if you could say, I know where your road is going. I know where that road goes. It goes into judgments. It goes into destruction. It goes into pain. It goes into eternal and present realities. And, and so it just causes us one more time to sit there and say, that's not the road you should want. 
that's not the road you should want. You shouldn't look there and go, that, that sounds doable. No, you should look at that. That's not the way I want to do my life. Well, if you don't want to do your life this way, well, again, it goes back two verses to say, then you should be someone who values the word of God all the days of your life. Say, God, speak it into me. Speak, you keep me on the right path because I know I'll make a mess of life if I don't have constant help. I, I'll, I'll make a mess of these things if God is just not constantly speaking into my life because I don't want this. I don't want the life of someone who rejects what God has to say. I don't want where that goes. May it be so for you tonight. May it be that you find yourself both instructed in that this evening, that maybe something is leading you into the right course, but at the same moment, again, just calling you to see the longevity of this. There's to say, okay, wherever this goes, I know where I want my life to end. I want to be the one that's growing in wisdom. I want to be the one that has life and is abiding in satisfaction, is being rescued from evil. That's a better choice. And he's inviting us to make sure that's the choice that you are making today. And we'll keep making all the days of your life. May God make it be so. So we're going to close. You can close your Bibles, your, your notebooks that are there, and just longing that wherever God has met you in it this, eve, this evening, that he would instruct you in that, that he would draw your life into the course that he would have for you. So let me take a moment, just lead us in prayer, and just hoping whatever that is he's spoken to you tonight would be effectively just correcting and leading you into the things that he has for you. God, thank you for your heart for us. Thank you for loving us enough to give us your word, to give us your wisdom, to give us what you described as the fear of the Lord. And you told us that if that's what we choose, it's life. It's life. It's satisfying. And it will rescue us from evil. God, I believe you. And I recognize that I need that. I need that today. And I'm going to need that tomorrow. And I'm going to need it the day after. As many days as you give me. God, I need to be one that will constantly be listening to you. If not, I'm going to go astray. I just recognize that's true. That is true for me and that is true for every one of us. The only way that we can stay on course, the only way that we can keep from being in that path that's going to bring sorrow and destruction and judgment is by you being our rescue. Thank you for your truth that is a light to our path that would guide us in the right ways. Would you make it so right now? Lord, if there's a correction that's needed in us right now, if we're a little bit off course, if just our, our bearings are off between what is right and wrong, would you just correct that so that we're on course? Would you lovingly just correct us now? Thank you that you love us enough to do that, to discipline us with hope. And then, Lord, help us to keep receiving this the rest of our days. May we be such people that, that know that we need you every day. Know that we need your truth every day. God, help it to be that place of value in us right now. And God, thank you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your truth. Thank you for your ways. Thank you that they're good. Now lead us in all that that is. We pray for it together in Jesus' name. Amen.